Hey, y'all, welcome back to Football Talk with Coach Chip. Today we're talking offensive philosophy. I got a lot to deal with, and um, let's get started. Right, I'm not going to go through all these and insult your intelligence by reading the entire list to you, but I'll give you a chance. If you want to, you can pause right now and just read through these. That's two slides of them, and then we're going to go through each one of them. I'm going to try to do this episode in such a way I can go back later and splice it up. And so let's go ahead and look at uh, get, look at the next slide. Okay, these are things that I, over the years that I've gathered. Um, some of them are kind of things that I are somewhat original to me, um, or I took what somebody else was doing, a philosophy they had, and tweaked it to fit me, which is what I think coaching is all about. Some of them I just flat out stole from other people. Again, you can pause it and read through these yourself. Also, at the end. You can hit me up at my email, siegel.chip at gmail.com, and I will send you this slideshow for nothing, just the amount of time it cost me to, to do it. Boom, free. And uh, just send it to you so you'll have it. Uh, speaking of that, if you want a copy of my new playbook, it's my first thing I've done, uh, $20. Hit me up at siegel.chip. You'll see that below in the in the comments and in the in the notes below and also at the end of the slideshow. Let's get started. All right, first off, be prepared. You know, a lot is said about coaches and play calling, fans, uh, reporters, journalists, especially with social media, people coming, oh, so-and-so got out coach. You don't get out coach. I'd say 90% of the time, minimum 75, 90% of the time, you do not get out coach during the game. You get out coached in spring ball. You get out coached in preseason ball. You get out coached during the week. You outthink yourself. You get out coached at Sunday meetings or whenever it is that y'all meet as a staff. This was preparation. We had called a different play. Quarterback saw that the uh, – what the defense was in, nobody in the middle of the field, you can see. And he put this kid in motion. We had a rule. Quarterback tells you to do it, you do it. If he's wrong, we'll fix him. Much easier to fix one than having two guys on two different pages. See, look, he looks over at him and says, go in motion. He goes, leave early. Boom. He sees two bump with him. He knows his H is open. That's preparation, y'all. That's pure and simple. It's a heck of a football player. Okay, but this kid's 10th grader playing in his 15th game. Starting at quarterback, state championship game, playing at Bryant Denny Stadium, pretty big stage. Thousands of people there, even in the in the cold. It was the first state championship game, second one, the game before us, that had been played in the snow in the state of Alabama. All right, so be prepared. Preparation trumps play calling. And if you're prepared and the kids are prepared, play calling take care of itself most of the time. All right. Also about be prepared. Same situation. This is uh, the next football game, opening game of the next year, same thing. This team didn't have enough kids on the field. He didn't know that at the time. He just knew they didn't have enough kids over here to cover these two cats. So he it's a run play. You can see how they block. See, boom, there's a kick. And he told number two, the running back, he said, do a shoot. See, so look at him. He's telling him what to do. O-line's already set, and he realizes it. Again, this is preparation. This is preparation. This is not play calling. I did not call this play. I'm in the press box. Okay. You say, well, you did call the play. Yeah, I called it during the week. I called it during the, you know, during the course of our life together, you know, with number four there, you know, through off season training, you know, through film study. Preparation trumps play calling. Be prepared. All right. Take advantage of what the defense is giving you. All right. Nobody's covering number two receiver over here. Watch what happens. They're going to take advantage. This comes through preparation as well. Coach them up, you know, where they when they see stuff. Take what they're giving you, don't and don't force things. Don't force things as a play caller. Don't force things. Okay. Don't force things as a quarterback. Take advantage of it. All right. Look, nobody's there. Boom. Okay. Build the offense around your better players. Okay. The the uh, quarterback's one of my better players. We were a jet team. We got backed up by a punt. Okay, sometimes that's going to happen, I don't care how good or how bad you are. And so I didn't want to run jet and take a chance of missing a block on the edge and getting a, a safety, so I just ran quarterback power. He checked out, 99 yards. Okay, trust me, you know, I'm not going to stay here and kill time. All right, so build the offense around your better players. Okay, it's good. To, I mean, I've got a system, but you got to have a system that's flexible enough. 
Okay, get the ball to playmakers in space. You saw that with the uh, with number two catching the ball a while ago when nobody covered him. So get the ball to them. Use jet screens, quick passes, options, whatever you have to do. Get it to your playmakers in space. Sometimes you got to create space with your offensive line. It's knock people off the ball. But you think that's all offensive football is. I don't care if you're a power team, you're full house T. Your blocking scheme is trying to create space for your running backs. Okay, you may be trying to create space in a phone booth or create space in a narrow ditch, but you're not going to score touchdowns if you're not creating space either with your blocking, with your with your play calling, with your formations, with your pass routes, whatever it is you're doing, it's all about creating space so your best players, your playmakers can make plays. All right? Going along with that, think players, not plays. What's my best play? I'm going to run my best play here. Uh, what's your best play getting to your best player? If that's not the same play. Think players. I'm reminded of the Nick Saban story that he's told so many times on the banquet circuits and when he goes around speaking to groups all over the United States. He called timeout. It, I think it was the region conference championship, whatever. It's 1960s, back when quarterbacks called the plays. And uh, he said, what do you think, coach? Coach says, I think you need to get the ball. And he goes, you're going to let me call it? Yeah, you're going to call it. But you got like an all-state wide receiver over here on your right. You got an all-state running back, okay, in the backfield. I think you need to get to one of those players. Think players, not plays. So Saban, young Nicky Saban, 10th grader, went out and called a play-action pass, faking it to his stud running back and throwing the ball to his stud wide receiver. Think players, not plays. Have an offensive system that's flexible enough from year to year you can base it and center it around your current players, okay? Unless you're at a school that can recruit, and you can recruit guys that are going to come in and you can make them, mold them to your system, but you can't always do that. You take a coach that's been somewhere 10 or 15 years, and he's run the same offense every year and the same defense, he's either been real fortunate, okay, or he uh, he's recruiting. Because that's tough to do. We're talking about it at the high school level. It's very tough to do. So have an offensive system. Like I think my system, and you can see that in the playbook for $20, hit me up at Siegel.chip at gmail.com. I think my system is flexible enough. I can use it, whether I got a big bruising team, we're going to run power and you know, all this kind of stuff, or I got a quarterback that can throw it pretty good with some receivers that can go get it. And you can cater it around those kids. And that's what you need to do. Think players, not plays. What do I have available to me? And we're all not lucky enough to get those move-ins, <clears throat> move-ins, I'm doing air quotes, uh, year to year. All right, be able to stretch the field vertically and horizontally. You can do this through play calling. You can do this through formation. I like stretching the field horizontally with jets and fast screens, stretching it sideline to sideline, making them play, making the defense cover all 53 and a third yards of the width of the field through jets and fast screens. You can stretch the field vertically with deep routes, post and fades. It don't mean you got to throw them all the time, but just running the routes means you got to cover them. You're stressing the secondary anytime you send somebody deep. Okay. And sooner or later, they may get tired. They may get lazy. Who knows? They may lose focus, but you don't have to throw the ball deep all that often, but you need to run people deep often. If you followed me, you've been subscribing and listened to a lot of my videos and watched them, you know that I love the fade. Not necessarily throw. If you don't throw it but two or three times a game, great. Okay? So you don't have to throw the ball deep just, you know, to threaten them. And uh, they got to cover deep routes. It doesn't matter who you put out there. No matter how fast you put me out there, they're going to cover me, okay? So that's just the truth of the matter right there. All right, think first downs. Move the chains. Don't always think home runs. This is hard to do. How many times have you seen a kid get a one-yard loss on a, on a zone play or whatever or a one-yard gain, and if they just banged it in there, they could have got four? And you got to teach running backs this too. Think first downs, okay? Home runs are going to happen. But just like in baseball, and most baseball players will tell you this, home runs are accidents. They're happy accidents in the words of Sister Hazel. So think first downs and move the chains. First down after first down after first down is going to demoralize the defense. It's going to be, oh, my God, you got them tired. You see those hands on their hips, hands on their knees. 
and it gives your defense a break, but it also demoralizes their offense, their quarterback, their OC, their head coach. Get us the ball back. And you're just keeping it away from them. There's a lot to be said for that. You don't have to just be explosive. They're great. Explosive plays are good. Okay, but a long clock-eating drive that involves multiple first downs can destroy an opponent's morale. And in, in the words of, uh, of Coach Yost, leave no doubt that you've kicked their butt. Run it up, Herman. Leave no doubt. And you do that with a long, time-consuming, I just whipped your hiney drive. All right, now, find the weak spots through film study. Find the weak spots in the defense. They got a really good defensive end right here. So what we did was we set the strength there because they flipped him. He always went to the strength side. And then we motioned our kid back, and boom, we had a, we had a check out. Okay? Find the weak spots. Attack those spots. All right, put the better defenders. You can run right at the best defender. Put them in conflict with reads through. You got a good linebacker. You want to slow his butt down? RPO is Heine. You got a good defensive end? Read him. Option, read him. Okay? Run an option and read him. Look at this right here. You say this is the best player they got right here, this defensive end. Run right at him. You ain't got to worry about him whipping anybody's fanny. Okay, he's a good technique player, and he squeezes down on that double team right there. Boom. Then you're giving it. Okay? All right, there's all kind of ways to do it. You can do the old zone read where you're reading the backside guy. Put the best players they have on defense in conflict through different reads and different option plays that you have in. could be an RPO, an RRO, a run-run option, any of these things. Okay, put those better players in conflict. Make them wrong. I don't care how good they are. If you cast doubt in their mind, they're not as good. They're not as fast. All right, treat big plays like sudden change. Now, this is something I know I'm not the only one that does it, but I've been preaching it for years. I know going back to the 80s. I love to go super fast tempo after a big explosive play and run our best play immediately. Like we'll, I'm just going to make a scenario up. We throw like a 30-yard fade ball. We catch it down there on the 20-yard line going in. We know we're going to hustle our butt down there, line up. Ball's going to be on, let's say it's on the right sideline. Ball's going to be on the right hash. Heck, my quarterback, if he's been with me for a minute, he knows we're fixing to run jet. Okay, we run a jet, okay, and break it for a long one. We're going to come back probably real quick and run something off jet, whether it be a jet counter, whether it be a jet power, boom, right now. Even if we're not in tempo at the time, we're just, and you know, I don't like the huddle. And so that's what we do. That's why I love to do that. And you should have your best two or three plays have one-word names. And they know the formation. We did this on um, third and short for many years ago. You know, if we got third and one, we knew we were coming back and depending, we were a triple option team, we we're going to come right back right now and run the dive. We're going to read it. We're going to run the dive and then fake the option because we got them tired. We just had broke off a big one, okay, preferably with a different player. And run that play immediately. Third and short, boom, have a one-word call. You know, say the word. Say, Bill, Bill, Bill. Everybody on the field knows what Bill is. Bill means I line up right here. We're going to run it on this. All right, another good thing to do is line up right now and run a no play. You just gas their butt the mentally. Because if their body's tired, their mind is tired. Okay, if they're out there fighting for survival because you've gassed them and gashed them, boom. All right, watch this. It's 1987, Division II National Championship game. My beloved Troy State University Trojans, before they dropped the state out of it, play in Portland. I think it's Portland State. They were a run and shoot team. And it's a tie ball game right here, 17-17. Mike Turk, one of the best option quarterbacks I've ever seen, is about to break off a long run on the option. But they're going to call it back. Okay? They called it back. So now the ball's on the 40, but the defense is gas. Look at all those guys on defense chasing after Turk. Okay? And he scores. But they called it back. All right, boom, very next play, they come back, Turk's out, he's gassed, boom, bam. Come back and run the reverse off the option. All right, he's going to get the ball down, I think it's the 15. Boom, hurry up, line up, come right back. Now run reverse the other way. Ching. Touchdown. Three plays, one of them didn't even count. Three plays, and they ran them, bam, bam, bam. I wish I could have found the actual game film and showed it to you, okay, but all I could find was highlights like that 1987 season, you know, Division II program. If somebody out there 
that knows where the entire game is. I'd love to get a hands on, uh, my hands on a copy of that. But that's a case of treating big plays like sudden change. Come right, go for the juggler right now. The defense is gassed. Get after their butt. Control game tempo. Always practice fast because you can slow it down in a game. Why should we practice fast? First off, you've heard me say it if you're a subscriber. Get as many reps as you can in practice. Practice fast. Get more reps. Okay, then you can dictate tempo in the game, and that keeps the defense off balance. You can go slow. You can go regular speed. You can go fast. You can go fake fast, as some people call it. Go fast and fake going fast. You know, line up real quick and hut, 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 and then let the coach see what they're in, call the play, let the quarterback see what they're in. He's got a good idea. And even though you're not going fast, you're stressing the defense by making them line up. All right, have an automatic call or two on third and short, like I mentioned. Okay, no, you're going to, you know, one or two calls and one or two words. We call this, line up in this formation, run this play right now. Okay, and also, of course, coach, you're in charge of the play. I don't know too many teams now are letting the kids call the offense. You're in charge. So how do you practice going slow? You just slow down getting the play and don't give it to them until there's like 12 seconds, whatever you need to do, 15, 12, 10 seconds left on the play clock. Okay, you need to practice it, you know, on Thursday so they get used to it, so the line doesn't get set and get down and have their hand on the ground for a long period of time just so they know what's going on. But you, you're in charge of that. You don't got to practice going slow. Okay, eliminate turnovers by emphasizing it year-round. How do you do that, Coach Chip? Are you going to have about 60 workouts? 60 to 80, 60 is a minimum. You're not going to be successful. You're not getting at least 60 in in the offseason from January until the time practice starts in late July, early August. All right, practice it then. All right, that's 60 opportunities to incorporate ball security during stretching, agility, speed training, et cetera. Get the football out, have those kids doing those drills with a ball in their hand. If they don't touch a football except two weeks in spring, and then the four, three or four weeks of preseason, you expect them to be able to to do right, to practice a good ball security, and they've only and you've just peed away all those days you could have been practicing ball security. You know, let them stretch with the ball, high and tight as you're walking around, poke at it, okay, during their agilities, during their speed training, when they're doing those, um, you know, the high knees stuff like that. Get the balls out. Okay, if you, and if you live in one of those states that doesn't let you get the balls out during the off season, you need to relocate. God Almighty, go somewhere that take football serious. Crap. If you want it to matter to the kids, they must see it matter to you, and this is how you make it matter. When, you, when you're doing it January all the way through until August, ball security, they know it matters. But if all you do is preach it during the season or during you know when you get the helmets and shoulder pads on, what message are you sending the kids? This is an afterthought. Weightlifting is more important than ball security. I don't think so. That's not that's not your mind. Okay? So let them see it. They can't see inside your head, but they can see your actions and they can hear your words. Make it matter to them. Keep penalties to a minimum by stressing it year-round. Do all your weight training, speed training, everything, conditioning on a whistle or on the snap count. We've done weightlifting on a snap count. Set. Ready, blue go, and everybody starts. Somebody starts early, you flag them. Make the whole team stop what they're doing, do five push-ups, five burpees, whatever your consequence is right there, penalize the entire group. Okay, if you got 20 kids in the weight room, all 20 of their fannies are doing whatever the consequence is, just like on Friday night when somebody jumps off sides. you got to do that. Also, it's a good way if you're going to be a tempo team to go tempo because they know everything. So, all right, here we go, and call a snap count, Okay. You stress it. Make it matter. An overwhelming percentage of penalties, I think this is not even a theory or an opinion, due to a lack of discipline, a lack of focus. It can be taught. You can teach it through rep after rep after rep in the weight room, during your speed training, during your conditioning. And if a kid, for instance, you got a lineman or anybody, they got their hands too wide on close grip. I know when you begin with, you may want to give them a week, learn how to do it. After that, hands are too wide. Don't say a word to them. Just blow the whistle. Hey, we got so-and-so. Illegal use of the hands. He got his hands outside the framework of the body. Here we go. 15 burpees or 10, whatever it is. Whatever you're going to do, penalize the entire group. 20 kids in the weight room, 20 kids doing the consequence, just like on Friday night. Okay? Make it matter to your kids. All right. Score enough points to win. Duh. Okay? My point is this is to you, coach. 
This is to you, offensive coordinator. This is to you, head coach. Don't worry about it, okay? You can't do anything about it except work on it next week. But if you win, you win. 6 two forty eight shootout win is the same as a 3 nothing slobber knocker. It just is, okay? All right, say, hey, we're fortunate. We sucked, but we won. All right, let's get better. And make sure they know we didn't do a good job. Okay, obviously the team on the, the left here, they scored 48 points, but their defense wasn't real good. Over here, you got two defenses playing their butts off. Okay, stress what you got to stress, emphasize what you got to emphasize, compliment what you need to compliment, critique what you need to critique, do your job, coach them up. Score TDs in the red zone. Duh. Duh. Again, but guys, you got to practice it. This is to you. This is not to the kids. You know, everybody knows you got to score TDs anytime you got the football, right? Well, not anytime, but most of the time. 2017, uh, by the way, cover your ears, Falcons fans. The Patriots scored a TD on 70% of their trips to the red zone. The rest of the league, slightly over half. Of course, the Patriots won the Super Bowl that year. you got to score points when you get the ball in close. In my opinion, practice in the middle of the field, overrated and overdone. You need to practice red zone and practice coming out. Having the ball on the one coming out, having the ball inside the 20 going in. There's two things where you're going to, hey, you're going to get, you're going to win games or you're going to get your fanny beat in those two parts of the field. Not finishing drives and not getting that ball off of your own goal line. That's going to get your fanny beat. Okay. Well, you've got to do that. And I know because I've done it. In 2017, we didn't lose a game. We didn't have a close game. Okay. We didn't have a close game. But there were two or three times my sphincter factor was maxing out when a team got the ball and punted it down in there deep because I knew we weren't prepared because I didn't do a good enough job coaching coming out. Okay? That won't happen again. You've got to practice these things, score TDs in the red zone, and get the ball out of your own end of the field. Okay? Like everything else, you got to practice it. All right, that's it. This is the first slide. I'm just going to leave it here. You can pause it to see it. If you want a copy of this, there's a second one right there, my offensive philosophy. Hit me up at Siegel.chip at gmail.com, Siegel.chip at gmail.com. I'll send you this slideshow free of charge. Just send it as an attachment. But while you're there, while you're emailing me, go ahead and request a copy of my playbook. It's only $20. You can pay me through Venmo or Cash App. I'll tell you why down in the bottom in the, uh, in the description, in the comments. I'm going to put some links and also put my Venmo and my Cash App. And, of course, the email will be down there as well. Hey, share it. Share, share the channel. Subscribe. Subscribe the channel. And like it. And tell your friends about it. Okay? Go ahead and share it to them. But make sure you're subscribing. Listen here. Until next time, be elite.